Yeah, hello and good morning from Toronto, Ontario. My name is Anna Sangster from the International Federation on Aging, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this next webinar in our Age-Friendly Webinar Series, entitled The Decade of Healthy Aging, Scaling Up Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. It is a great privilege today to be joined by Ms. Alana Officer, Team Lead for Healthy Aging Division of Healthy Populations at the WHO in Geneva, Switzerland. Alana today will be discussing a variety of topics as they relate to the inclusion of age-friendly cities and communities within the decade. There is perhaps no one better suited to speak to this topic as Alana is not only overseeing the development of the decade of healthy aging, but also coordinates the WHO's work on age-friendly environments, including the global network on age-friendly cities and communities, as well as the global campaign to combat ageism. Now, before turning things over, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to write these down and submit them via the Q&A function, and these can then be answered during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please also remember to use the Q&A rather than the chat function to submit these questions. This will allow us to keep track of the questions a little bit better and also send Alana any pending questions after the webinar has taken place. So thank you again for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to you, Alana. Terrific. Thanks, Anna. Um, uh, good day to everybody, depending on where you are. And uh, thank you very much to IFA also for coordinating the WHO and IFA webinar series. So what I'm going to do today is just uh, give you some background on uh, the decade of healthy aging and really try and make the links between the decade and the work that we do on age-friendly cities and communities. So uh, as if any of you have participated in some of the previous webinars that IFA and WHO have run together, you would know that uh, the World Health Organization adopted in 2016 a global strategy and action plan on aging and health. And the vision of that uh, strategy was a world in which everyone can live a much longer and healthier life. Um, and it had two basic goals. If we had the evidence already, we should be implementing it to try and maximize people's functional ability, i.e ensuring that older people can do what they what they value and by next year trying to sort of fill the evidence gaps and build the partnerships necessary to support a decade of healthy aging and for those of you who who are not sort of aware of how who functions so these action plans are decided by 194 countries so all of the member states of the World Health Organization um, agree on what it is that we should collectively be doing. And when we say collective, it means what a country's doing, what is WHO as the sort of secretariat um, with our other national and international partners. So the strategy um, builds on a lot of work that's already come. So we first developed a world report on aging and health. Um, that in itself built on the work that had been done and continues to be done under the uh, under MIPA um, and aligns very strongly with uh, the SDGs, uh, which also obviously are until 2030. So many of you will know, but I think it's kind of helpful when we think about the decade to just think about, well, how will the world be different in some ways over the next 10 years? So we know that by the end of the decade, one in six people worldwide will be age 60 and over. Today, that's one in eight. And that the number of people age 60 years and older will have grown by 56% to reach 1.4 billion. So just in that 10 years, that growth is, is incredible. Um, as of next year and over this period, our, oh well, older people will outnumber children under the age of 10. We all, older people already outnumber children under the age of five, but by the end of the decade, that will be children under the age of 10. And 80% of older people will be living in lower middle income countries. So already today, we know that many older people are being left behind without access to even the most basic resources, yeah, that you would anticipate for a life of meaning, for one of dignity and equality. And all countries uh, face quite major challenges to ensure that their health and social care systems are really responsive and uh, to this increasing number of older people. But for low and middle income countries particularly, because this pace of population aging is so much faster than in the past, 
then developing countries need to adapt much more quickly um, than, than often higher income countries, but from lower levels of, of income and infrastructure and capacity in which to do it. So the decade is really intended, so these 10 years of concerted action is to build a sort of connections and collaboration um, among governments and civil society, you know, health, social care and other professionals, the media, academia, the private sector and international agencies. And in, do, in developing that uh, broader connection and collaboration, uh, we want to ensure that older people are really central you know, to all of the, the phases in the development of the decade. So we've taken uh, a number of steps and, and Miriam Nanda, who uh, is one of my colleagues, had talked a little bit in a previous webinar on what we'd done. So what I want to do is, is look over what we've done in the development of the decade and just make the connections with the work that we all do on age-friendly cities and communities. So in the process to develop the decade, we started by really asking people in low and middle income countries predominantly, what did they want? And uh, we got 160 respondents from, so these are focal points, people responsible for aging in countries uh, from 81 countries. And when they responded to what they thought we should be focusing on, they said they wanted improved engagement with older people. They wanted, uh, better research and data to understand what older people's needs were so that they can better tailor their response. They wanted to strengthen uh, their health and long-term care, but really where people live um, to make sure that, the, that people were getting access to these services as close as possible to where they live. And they wanted to improve sort of multi-sectoral action recognizing that aging is not only about health, but it really requires all sectors to work together. And when they said what they thought were really priorities, if they were going to look at success, they wanted to be able to see improvements in healthy life expectancy, not just longer lives, but healthier and longer lives. They wanted to see uh, communities that were much more inclusive and accessible and, and age friendly. And they wanted to see a reduction in the numbers of people who required care from somebody else, which is what we call care dependency. So you will see, if you look at that, that they wanted multi-sectoral action, which we, you know, at community level, but also strengthening health and, and uh, social care. Um, and they wanted engagement with older adults. So things that are very integral to the work that we do in age friendly cities and communities. We also looked at, um, and you can read the full report on the Decade website, but we looked at what were those factors that work and don't work in decades, given that there have been decades of decades. Uh, we wanted to learn, you know, from, from people who had come before us. And, and they suggested, uh, you know, that it was really important to have a human face to the work that we do, to have uh, member state champions, of which we have a lot, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, to have very engaged and committed partners, particularly civil society. And for any of those of you who are currently working um, in age-friendly cities and communities or are planning to do that, just recognizing the importance of, of having champions in that work at a local level to, to work across very diverse civil society. And also uh, to focus not just on a particular issue, but to try and look at how you can transform the sort of ecosystem, you know, how things are coordinated and financed, uh, you know, is also really important. Um, one of the things that we learned, and I'm going to come to this in, in the end when we talk about what we're going to do going forward, but that countries, if they really want to make a difference, they need some very simple concrete guidance and packages of solutions uh, that they can use to advance this work. They need a strong strategic policy framework, which is also the intent of having a proposal for the decade, um, and that they needed to work across sectors. So a, a key step in the development of, of the decade was uh, working with uh, member states at all different levels to sort of harness political opportunities and listen to different perspectives. 
So I wanted to, you, you will recognize uh, many of the different logos on here. So the G20 uh, has been discussing aging this year. APEC has been discussing aging. Um, the high level forum on the silver economy, which has been the president of that has been Finland, has been discussing it. Uh, the entire World Health Assembly also, there was a, an, an event scheduled. So it's, it's the decade itself um, and, and therefore discussions around uh, age-friendly cities and communities has been part of very core sort of political, global and regional uh, agendas over the last 12 months. Um, but I wanted to sort of break that down a little bit. I'm sorry I can't chat to you in the sense that, you know, I, you know for those of you, do you know about the G20? Yeah. So uh, the world's 19 largest economies, basically, um, and uh, the European Union, um, and they, uh, a different country obviously takes on or, or hosts the G20 each year. And this year, the host of the G20 was Japan. And aging was decided as one of the priorities uh, that was discussed, you know, across a number of the different ministerial meetings, but particularly in the area of health. And on the slide, what I wanted to do is just show you that, you know, the, the level of engagement that's coming at such a high level um, around the work uh, on healthy aging, but also on cities and communities. Um, and I think that it's important to think about this because the G20 currently uh, about 72% of all older adults live in G20 countries. Um, so if the G20 decides that they're going to take action and they really do drive action at national level, then there is huge potential for uh, change and well, for transformative change for many people. So the Okayama Declaration of the G20 Health Ministers this year affirmed that active and healthy ageing was indeed a priority of the G20 countries. That like, interestingly, as you would have seen from what countries, you know, when the 81 countries responded to our survey, what they were most interested in is extending healthy life expectancy, making sure that people can have that longer but healthier life, as well as a, a, a better quality of life. Um, the G20 countries also recognise the importance of, of, even if this was being discussed within the health minister's meeting, the, the need for multi-sectoral policies um, and policy cohesion to foster healthy ageing, uh, to foster active and healthy ageing um, for all older adults, regardless of their economic status. And, you know, they, they looked about what needed to happen around nutrition and around health and social protection, employment, transportation, housing. So really a very broad perspective on the different sectors that could contribute to fostering healthy ageing. Um, and particularly, you know, this, this sense that they, the, the health ministers were committed very much to working, you know, with other relevant ministers and sectors and stakeholders to be able to create age-friendly environments, um, which includes also sustainable health and long-term care. Uh, within the Okayama Declaration, they were also had a very strong focus on uh, people with dementia and, and within that promoting both age-friendly and dementia-inclusive environments uh, with an objective also that they wanted to share their experience and best practices um, that they're using to build communities that are conducive to healthy and active ageing and to, to build on the existing initiatives and, and promote more shared learning and engagement. They also very specifically in the statement uh, recall the fact that WHO in, remember when I talked about the strategy, you know, there was a request to their develop the decade of healthy aging. They recalled that and that they uh, asked WHO to prioritise uh, the development of the decade as one of, their pri as one of our priorities. So very strong support from the G20 this year on, on the development of the decade and uh, integral to that very much, you know, the development of age-friendly environments. Uh, Chile was the host of, uh, of uh, the APEC uh, this year. 
and uh, which is the Asia and Pacific Economic Cooperation. Um, and they had uh, the aging world as their um, sort of theme for the, the APEC uh, discussions this year. And in particular, the high level meeting highlighted that they really wanted to focus on integrative preventative approaches. So they were very interested, um, which is reflected a lot in, in what other member states have been calling for as well. But, you know, how to promote active and healthy lifestyles, how to promote better nutrition, smoking sensation, reduction of alcohol. So, you know, in terms of behavioral changes, um, including for, you know, across the life course and into older age. Uh, very strongly pushing uh, creation of age-friendly environments uh, through multi-sectoral attention, through health, uh, labour, housing, transportation, social protection, etc. They were promulgating very much this idea of a whole of government multi-sectoral approach to healthy ageing, which reflects very much the, the idea of how do you create age-friendly communities or age-friendly cities. And they, like the G20, were reaffirming the importance of continued partnership and collaboration with other and multilateral fora, with civil society, the private sector. So this sense that, you know, as I said in the beginning with the decade, wanting to build this global collaboration, you know, that, that desire to sort of work collectively together comes out, you know, in a lot of these global and regional fora. The last one I just wanted to talk to you was the one about uh, Finland hosting the European uh, Union this year um, and or the Council of the European Union, sorry, and they have the presidency up until the end of December and July. They hosted a, a high level forum on the silver economy and there's a full report that's coming out at I think in the next couple of days, actually, but they produced a policy outcome brief and that policy outcome brief, uh, which you can get access to if you look at the updates on the uh, decade of healthy aging, and I'll show you where they are at the end of the webinar. But they said, you know, we need to have a very strategic focus on aging, that we needed to take a multi-generational response. So this was something that was a little bit different to some of what we'd seen in the G20 and um, APEC, but again, reflecting what's happened in those other fora, you know, consider active and healthy aging, also with a focus on the employability of, of older people as an important key for well-being and, and sustainability. Strong focus on women um, and on women's well-being. Uh, they focused also on the importance of cities, um, you know, in their role in promoting healthy aging and a good quality of life, uh, as well as the potential for social and technical, technological innovations within communities and cities. Again, focusing on this need to partner and collaborate with different stakeholders. And again, like the, the G20 and APEC, urging member states and others to join and support the activities during the, the decade. So, I think you see in this process of, of broad political uh, consultation that we're starting to see a lot of synergies in terms of what countries uh, are wanting to push forward over the next 10 years. And certainly the work on, you know, cross sectoral collaboration at the level of cities and communities is really a priority um, for most countries. So, uh, we also ran um, and, and had invited uh, city and community leaders to engage as well. We ran an online survey um, in all six languages for a couple of months just to see if we could get broader uh, civil society engagement. We were hearing a lot from uh, countries, uh, from, from national governments, um, so to, to identify uh, other stakeholders and, and hear their perspectives in the development of the decade. And for those of you who are not uh, receiving them, you can easily sign up for them. Um, but we do produce uh, regular updates on the process of developing the decade. So any of these discussions that take place or any of these fora, we report back on them in terms of uh, what's being discussed um, and the main messages from each of those fora. 
So just to give you an idea, uh, so far, you know, we've had 89 member states, so they're our member states, so countries that have provided substantive inputs into one or more of those different steps that we've taken. Uh, we've had 19 UN agencies and international organizations who have also provided comments and inputs into the development of the proposal and around 300 non-state actors uh, in this process. So to give you an idea now, having, you know, uh, surveyed countries and tried to learn from what others have done on decades and listen to all of these uh, perspectives from different political fora um, and consultations. We've been through this very iterative process of sort of developing a concept note and, and, a, and, and a, you know, an initial very early draft and then having two more drafts since then which have been consulted on with countries. And what we now have is a proposal which is intended to really make a difference in the lives of older people, their families and their communities. And it focuses on four actions. One of them is changing how we think, feel and act towards age and ageing, um, or in short, uh, combating ageism. Developing communities in ways that foster the abilities of older people. Um, ensuring that older people get access to integrated care and primary health care that meets their needs and that for older people who do need access uh, to long-term care that they get it. And so over the next 10 years the intent is to really focus on people and where they live and who they live with and to make sure that we we sort of help to change the face of aging we build communities that can enable you know everybody to to age better um, and that they get the care whether it be health or social care that they need so uh we've already obviously been doing work in in in, in all of these different areas uh or WHO has with partners and, and across the UN. Um, and, but you know, in today's webinar, I wanted to focus specifically on what we've been doing in the area of developing communities that foster the abilities of older people. So uh, earlier this month, um, actually, you know, last month, because we're even more now, we, we reached our 1000 uh, member of the global network for age-friendly cities and communities. So that was 1,000 uh, cities or communities in uh, 42 countries covering about 260 million people in total. Um, and uh, that net, the network now is one of the fastest growing transnational city or community networks in the world. Uh, it grows on average by 50% uh, every year, or it has done for the last uh, three years. Um, and we see no, no likelihood that that's going to stop, I think, at this stage. Um, and as you would have heard from the, the, the G20 and from the APEC and from, from the EU presidency and others, there is really very strong interest um, in developing age-friendly cities and communities around the world. If you're looking at, at this slide deck, you will see that in the middle of my slide, uh, Africa, it looks pretty white. Um, and that's really uh, uh, where I know now many countries, uh, we've just had about 20 countries from the African region who are interested in starting to look at what they can do to create more age-friendly environments and specifically, you know, age-friendly cities and communities. So I think that over the next decade, we will see a, a massive expansion um, in Africa, as well as in Asia and other regions. Currently, our fastest growing region is in the Americas, certainly in Latin uh, America. And uh, very recently, we just hosted um, uh, a Hispanic conference on age-friendly cities and communities. So our first Hispanic uh, conference is now one third of our members are Spanish speaking, to just show you the, the extent of expansion. Um, so uh, the platform, so the intent for the decade is that there is 
a, a platform that will help us do things a little bit differently, building on some of the work that we've done through the global network, but really learning from um, current, you know, good practice around uh, supporting country action. And that platform is intended to help uh, give visibility to older people's voices um, and enable uh, engagement of, of, you know, and provide the tools for how to better engage uh, with older people in, in the process of developing the activities related to the decade. Uh, it's intended to support and nurture leadership and capacity, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, and to support stakeholders and connecting stakeholders at the various different levels, you know, whether that be at community level or at national level or across regions, and to foster research, data, knowledge, exchange and innovation. So uh, back to that point where I said nurture leadership and capacity. So another thing, for example, that we have been doing that has direct links to, work, to the work on age-friendly cities and communities as well, is we've just launched a new healthy aging impact in the 21st century uh, training program, which is a global online uh, program for leaders. Um, and it's really intended to uh, enable people to engage, you know, with this topic of, well, what is healthy aging? If we're going to have a decade of healthy aging, it's really important to understand what we mean by it. Um, building on sort of the work of the World Report and the strategy uh, and to sort of start to, to challenge how people might be thinking about uh, age and aging and how they can foster better foster opportunities uh, to, to create more age-friendly environments. So this is uh, to give you an idea of that training program, uh, which will be, we've just, uh, we had opened um, applications for potential participants um, and we got an overwhelming response and that training course will now start in the early part of January. But what it does is, uh, after an introductory period, it looks at, you know, what, what is aging, you know, what's happening with aging in a changing world. Um, it also then looks at what are the current societal responses to aging, uh, where are their strengths and where are some of the challenges. Uh, it also tackles the issue of ageism and how that affects how we're responding to, to older people and to aging. Um, it really focuses on what do we understand about healthy aging, um, you know, particularly looking at integrated care as well as the, the age-friendly environments work and how you would measure it. And then the uh, last few weeks, uh, because all of the training is done in setting up in terms of groups who work together across the period of the training, then they start looking for, for responses to particular challenges that they face within their own context. Um, and, and a key element of that work is, is will be also within uh, age-friendly environments. They get to, participants in the training get to choose either doing something within age-friendly environments or more specifically within integrated health and social care. Um, and they work with a series of, of mentors and uh, a couple of those mentors that will be working with us on the training program also have a background in age friendly cities and communities. So to, to reinforce uh, students learning in those particular areas. Uh, we also have uh, already, and I, and I want to sort of give you the sense of, of what are the current tools and resources that are available uh, two cities and communities already um, that will be uh, expanded on as part of the work on the decade. But we already have Age Friendly World, which is a, intended as a sort of a one-stop shop on age-friendly action really at, at, the, at the local level. Um, that provides information on the WHO Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, um, our core strategic partners or, or affiliates like IFA at the global level, but also those who function at a national level or a regional level. So it tells you a little bit about them and what they're doing. It gives uh, profiles of all members. So uh, all of the thousand cities and communities that are part of the network and, and the work that they are doing and their progress in becoming more age friendly. It also provides uh, an extensive database of concrete practices that cities and communities have been doing that they're proud of and that they're sharing. 
um, in terms, you know, could be anything either sector specific, you know, in terms of what they're doing on housing or what they've been doing on transportation or information and communication, or what they've been doing to improve mobility or, or reduce social isolation or reduce elder abuse. So it could be either outcome related, you can search or by specific sector, you can look at examples of, of small rural areas versus large urban centers um, to try and, and seek inspiration. And there's a really extensive resource library with guides and tools and, and past assessments and action plans and evaluations that can you know, be really useful for um, inspiration if, if you're interested in doing more work in the area. And then uh, with uh, IFA, we run this webinar series um, and we have newsletters and things that go out uh, as well in terms of supporting cities and communities. So where to uh, from here? Uh, so in response to uh, what countries and communities are asking for um, and what we know works, particularly in, in the development of the decade. Remember, if you go back to the lessons learned from past decades. So we uh, are going to update some guidance or the guidance that WHO provides on age-friendly cities and communities. We developed uh, the first guidance in 2007. Um, and now, you know, 12 years later, we're looking at, at updating that guidance, particularly with a focus on how do you develop more national level programs. Um, we will expand and update the database with uh, a series possibly on uh, specific topics. So we're looking at the next topic of looking at uh, rural communities and innovations in age-friendly communities, particularly with a focus on rural areas. Uh, we've got the generic training on healthy aging, but we would like to expand uh, that training uh, so that we have more training options for city and community leaders if they're wanting to develop uh, more age-friendly environments. We are particularly interested in developing with cities and communities tools to measure progress. So uh, we had developed uh, in 2015 uh, a guide to measuring age friendliness. Uh, we would like to look at different innovative ways that may be useful for cities and communities um, to be able to track uh, the progress that they're making in creating more age friendly environments. Um, whether that's using, um, you know, sort of uh, GIS data or, um, you know, existing uh, Google Maps or preferably more open source uh, data to be able to get a sense of, of how cities and communities are moving forward in, in their plans to become more age friendly. You know, that don't take too many resources. We're very conscious that for small communities, you know, tracking progress can be quite a costly exercise, but it's so important if you're going to be making investments to know that if they're making any difference. So we'd like to work with cities and communities there on, on how to do that better. And uh, we will continue to look for opportunities where we can convene and bring together uh, diverse stakeholders to learn from each other, uh, whether that be in, in the support, you know, that we provide and to, or that we work with in terms of IFA in, in their biennial conference, or the Hispanic conference that we ran last month, which brought together people around a particular language. Um, you know, we've also run workshops in uh, which we are likely to do in, in Africa, in French and English and in Arabic to be able to enable uh, cities and communities uh, to come together and to learn from each other. So there's some of the things, uh, so some concrete tools, some opportunities for learning and exchange, the opportunity to better support and connect people um, and to, to share information, uh, as well as being able to better measure, you know, uh, the progress that's been made, uh, key areas that we want to invest in uh, over the next 10 years. But most of all, I think, you know, we, we want to make those investments because we want, you know, together, uh, with you and, and others is to make a real difference in the lives of older people and their families and, and communities. And we believe that the best way to do that is to act locally. 
So uh, recognizing that even when acting locally, it's important for many communities because services and, and infrastructure are also influenced by other sub-national levels. So that could be regional or state level, depending on the country you're in. Um, so uh, we, you know, while we want to focus and see results at local level, we recognize that to generate that sort of impact, we will need to work at all different levels of government with very diverse sectors and stakeholders to be able to, to generate those sort of changes. So just for you in terms of the platforms uh, on the slide is the decade uh, link to the decade platform and there's a direct emailing email if you'd like to contact uh, either myself or Mary or, or reach out to anybody else who works on the decade. And for the age friendly world, there is the link there and we also have a direct email address uh, for that one as well. And now, Anna, am I going to do the plug or I'm going to pass over to you? You can pass it over to me. Right. Uh, just a quick plug before we go into the Q&A portion. Um, the IFA will be holding its 15th Global Conference on Aging next November in Niagara Falls, so 1 to 3 in November, and we're very excited to have um, Alana as our keynote speaker for that event. And uh, we'll also be holding an age-friendly summit on the 31st of October, so hopefully we can see some of you, if not all of you, there. Um, and yeah, we'll move into the, the Q&A now. So hopefully some questions will trickle in. Uh, and anyone who's online or calling in that would like to, I think there's a raise your hand function and we can see whether we can uh, get you talking to Alana as well. So uh, I'll kick it off with a, with a first question, Alana. Um, is there opportunity for countries who have been established within the network and have been kind of working towards goals for, you know, uh, one to five years now to more concertedly uh, support countries that are trying to become mortgage friendly? Yeah, great. Good question, Anna. Um, in, in fact, we're already doing that. And I think that uh, maybe it's the thing that I like, one of the things that I like the most about this network is that the, the richness of the knowledge and the experience is with the cities and the communities. It's not with us, yeah? So, which is, you know, we're a technical agency and that's our role in terms of norms and standards and evidence and expertise. But the lovely thing about the network is that the, the experience and the knowledge rests within, within the members, really, and within the affiliates. So already we leverage uh, and, and benefit enormously from the existing experience, yeah? So let me take Ireland, for example. So 10 years ago... Ireland was one of the first countries, you know, County Clare, I think, was, was involved in, in one of the, in the beginning of the age-friendly sort of research work. Um, and then over the last 10 years, they have been gradually investing in different counties across Ireland, doing their baseline assessments, working out their plans and what they could do, working across stakeholders to try and identify what resources existed and what change they could generate. Um, and uh, I'm really excited that uh, late away well, in next month in December, um, I will be going to Ireland and, and there the, the Prime Minister will be uh, having uh, an event congratulating basically Ireland to be the first country where all counties in the country uh, have become age friendly. Um, and that's a really exciting development, I think, um, but it's taken them 10 years. And, uh, but we're benefiting enormously, for example, uh, through the net connections we make with the network, Ireland's been supporting the development of a, a national program, age-friendly program in Norway, um, has been supporting the capacity development also of uh, age-friendly practitioners in uh, the United Arab Emirates. So just leveraging that experience. So we draw a lot on the experience within the network to be able to support other uh, network members or potential network members. Um, and uh, we do the same thing, for example, by language. So we've been uh, 
benefiting a lot from the experience in Spain and Argentina, also for work that's happening in Costa Rica and, and Chile and, and other countries. Um, the same thing between France and, and many Francophone countries. So uh, yes, that, that's happening a lot. And I hope that we will continue, we will in the development of the new guidance, draw on that wealth of experience that exists in the network, um, you know, for, for the next phase. Terrific. Um, speaking a bit to the some of the the online consultations, um, did you get kind of any feedback specifically from either network members or, or affiliates on 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 the decade in general? So, did we get feedback specifically from the network members and affiliates? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that all of the affiliates uh, to the network have uh, commented on the uh, decade proposal. Um, and in terms of the cities and communities, um, it's because the identifier wasn't at the level of the city, it was at the level of the individual and their organisation. Um, it's not always that easy to see whether it was a city-specific input um but certainly we've reached out multiple times to you know the they weren't quite a thousand members at that time but 900 and something to be able to comment on the proposal we also reached out to them initially also as part of the survey the original survey when we were starting to to speak to aging focal points at that time we also reached out to cities and communities in a separate survey trying to understand where their particular challenges were and where they felt the greatest needs were in terms of uh, creating age-friendly environments and the decade proposal reflects very strongly what uh, cities and communities said that they wanted to prioritize fantastic well, it looks like you've answered everyone's questions so effectively that there hasn't been any questions coming in. There you go. I know. More of a comment. I know. <laughs> I know. There's, uh, Patrick, what's Patrick saying? The International Organization for Standards has a new work project underway. Uh, oh, great. Dementia Inclusive Communities Caregivers. There you go. So Patrick's talking about the fact for those people who are working maybe more at national level, Patrick, um, uh, who want to get involved, that there is work that's being done through the ISO. Um, maybe this is something you want to talk to more specifically. Uh, maybe uh, Patrick Anna, you can, his hand, you can... I can see whether I can allow him to allow him to talk. Let's see whether he's around still. I don't see him raising his hand. I can't let him talk until he raises his hand, unfortunately. Patrick, if you're there, oh, raise there your hand. there he is. There he is. Okay. All right, you Patrick, you're on. There we go. I think he has to unmute himself. There we go. Can okay. You thank, thank you very much. This is actually an international um, initiative, uh, the, um, international, the ISO TC314, entitled Aging Societies is, uh, as mentioned, focusing on three specific areas uh, at this time and more to come. Uh, currently, we're uh, working on a document to deal with an age-inclusive workforce, wherein we're attempting to change the culture of organizations to allow people to work, or, and especially older people to work, continue after retirement or be hired after they've retired from something else. The second one is a framework for a, a dementia inclusive communities. And uh, this is a, a, a huge initiative in my country, Canada. Uh, the government just are releasing, a, I shouldn't say the government, excuse me, the, the organization, this Canadian Standards Organization releasing a, a, a research document on, on the topic, uh, why it's uh, why it's so important. And the third uh, group is working on a document that deals with uh, care, uh, a carer inclusive uh, organization where carers who are working with a, within an employer who also have um, other commitments to people who they care for at home are 
are recognized and uh, some modifications to their hours of work, et cetera, may be one solution to that. But it's a matter of actually uh, uh, establishing a little framework so that the organization or the company can, can adopt that, uh, that process. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That's great. Uh, we'll move to a question uh, now on from Su T. Chu. Um, Alana, what's the relationship between age-friendly cities and the UN Compact City Initiative? <clears throat> Compact City Initiative. You know, it's a great question. So in terms of there is no, uh, we work across with other transnational networks and with other uh, initiatives. So in terms of, um, you know, linking our work uh, with, you know, uh, UN Habitat and the Urban Agenda and, and the work on resilience and, and smart cities and healthy cities. Um, in terms of the UN's Compact on City Initiative, we don't do anything specifically, but you know what? I saw somebody, Catherine Klein might actually uh, be able to answer. I don't know if Catherine feels, because she's been uh, actively engaged in, in a lot of this work, if she feels that she could answer, uh, maybe she could put her hand up and Anna, you could, you could link to her. Happy to. Catherine, if you want to put your hand up, I'm happy to. There we go. Look at us becoming more interactive. On <laughs> There we go. Okay. Catherine, the floor is yours. I think you just need to unmute. I did. Okay. Thank you, Alana. Yes, I, I have been very active as a civil society representative of older persons, both prior to Habitat 3 and now afterwards. But the truth is, I don't know what the UN Compact Cities Initiative is. I'm here in New York. I'll find out as soon as the holiday here is over. Right. But I have been actively promoting age-friendly cities because, quite frankly, without a convention on the rights of older persons, this is by far our best opportunity. We do have a partnership with the disability folks who have created a global initiative for inclusive and accessible cities, and they are working to uh, engage mayors, local officials. We just came back from the World Congress in Durban, South Africa, to ensure that they follow up particularly on universal design. And I was able to get age-friendly cities as a component of what we're asking the mayors to agree to in a formal uh, way. But I don't know anything. Whoever asked the question, what is the UN Compact Cities Initiative? Maybe, may I, maybe, maybe uh, Shuti can uh, respond. I think you have to put your hand up and then Anna can connect you. Let's see, yeah, here we go. All right. Floor is yours, Shuti. Hi, <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you for the um, very excellent talk and we learned a lot. Yeah, because some friends have asked me whether uh, we are interested in uh, joining uh, this uh, initiative. I think it's, as you say, it's mainly about universal design, the uh, in inclusive and um, accessible environments for all. And when we were, when we were promoting our age-friendly city initiative in Taiwan, uh, mm -hmm. we were quite often asked that, uh, why only for uh, senior people? Why is not for everyone? And we said that actually, um, if we become friendly to the senior people, we are also friendly to everyone, mm -hmm. especially to those people with uh, disability and the pregnant women, etc. So I, I'm wondering whether, um, because there are many, many initiatives and how, how do we uh, connect and uh, synergize our efforts and to, so that we can mobilize uh, different departments in the government to see that actually there are similarities between these initiatives and by uh, implementing one will make them also, yeah, 
uh, better performing uh, yeah, in other in other initiatives. Mm. No, no, no. It's a good. It's a good point. I mean, I I think that the focus has to be local. So I think uh, the these various different initiatives are useful in the sense that that most of them, including the Age Friendly City and Community Network is uh, intended to sort of inspire and support and help connect uh, to advance work. But I think the big focus needs to be on the local community and what the specific needs are and, and investing in, in convening and bringing people together to identify how you can often just better utilize your existing resources. I think it's one of the exciting things about the work that I've seen around the world on age-friendly cities and communities is so often, it's, it's not a matter of increasing investments, but better using current resources and better working together to, uh, to generate, you know, positive changes for, for older adults and for, and in many cases for people of all ages. Um, so I think progressively, I know for, for WHO, we're going to look at, at improving. We work across a number of city networks, um, whether they be um, sort of, you know, condition specific. So on, on NCDs and injuries, we work across health very broadly. We work on, on creating, you know, cities for all ages in terms of the work on age friendly. And, um, and so, you know, uh, I think we, uh, with many other organisations, are looking at how we can uh, better connect the dots in terms of the work that we do, um, so that we can better support mayors and and you know their staff and personnel in in creating communities that are better places in which to you know be born and to live and to grow and to to age. So. Um, I think, you know, focusing in on who's local and then what other resources you might have at national level and being able to leverage those. Um, and then taking advantage of networks like ours, which, you know, for, for many, which uh, provide open resources, open information, um, access to, you know, we don't um, privilege members in, the, in that sense. We do in terms of support and, and uh um, and, and building connections, but in terms of information, we keep it open to, to all. So, you know, leveraging those opportunities, I think is also helpful. Thanks so much, Alon. I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, I'll look at uh, Megan Mutefa has, uh, she says here in Botswana, the retirement age is 60 years. However, the mean age for the population is 24.7. Therefore, it's very difficult to keep older people in formal employment. Do you have any ideas of circumventing this issue? Mm. Yeah, you're not, you're not alone in Botswana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we see that the average age of subsist subsistence farmers, for example, just in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, 60 and above. So, um, you know, I think some of the work that, uh, that Patrick was talking about and the work that we do around uh, tackling ageism. So, you know, challenging perceptions around age and aging are important within uh, the workplace, uh, irrespective of, of the country. Um, so that I think also uh, providing evidence and uh, on the importance of uh, multi-generational teams, challenging, uh, some of the misconceptions around work and age, for example, that you know, by, by taking older people out of the workforce, you're creating jobs for, for youth. Uh, that's a fallacy. It doesn't, it's not how it works. Older people in formal employment tend to occupy quite different roles than, than younger people. So removing them from the workforce doesn't liberate jobs for, for younger people. Um, so I think sort of, you know, creating work environments that are more inclusive where people can continue to, to be productive and to contribute, uh, challenging ageism within formal employment, you know, across the world. Um, and then also creating uh, more flexible work opportunities as well within firm, formal employment where that's possible so that uh, older people may not necessarily be working full time, but have a variety of, of options, maybe short term or, or, or part time. 
Um, also then looking at other forms of uh, income generating opportunities and informal opportunities. If we look at, uh, for example, the US, I think that the average age of entrepreneurs is something like 55. So just to say that even when formal opportunities uh, may be less uh, difficult to, to keep, that there are a number of other opportunities uh, for continued employment and, and engagement in the workforce. Um, so creating those opportunities as well and, and what that means in terms of, you know, uh, venture capital or fund, you know, or, or income, you know, or financing for those sort of opportunities also needs to be created. Okay, well, thank you so much, Alana. Special thanks to you for taking the time out of your day to be here. We really appreciate it. Uh, and to all of you listening, thanks so much for attending. And uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Terrific. Thanks a lot, Anna. And thanks for, for your questions and for being present. Take care. Bye-bye.